Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. How to Deal with Fear In his weekend message, Pastor Dell talks about fear, overcoming fear with faith. In December of 2019, the first reported case of coronavirus was reported. Since that day, almost 5 million people worldwide have died. In America, 45 million Americans have contracted COVID. Over 700,000 Americans died. Perhaps you have known those that have. It shut down our country. Now we are told by the CDC that we are now in a significant decline. 57% of the American population has been fully vaccinated. Many people have had COVID, and they have antibodies in their system, and the knowledge of the disease is far greater than it was in 2019. We all struggle with fear. In every circumstance of our life, we either operate in faith or fear. Everyone has their fears. Maybe you're afraid of losing your job, or your health, or your finances. The list could go on and on, for all of us have things that cause us fear. Charles Stanley said we could walk the path of fear or walk the path of faith. Six out of ten Americans battle some chronic disease. But if we're not careful, it won't be the disease that will be so bad, it will be the fear that controls our lives. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Fear defeats more people than any one thing in the world. There was a man in the Bible, 
His name was Hezekiah. He was a good king. He became king when he was 25, but when he was 39, he was diagnosed with a fatal disease, it got into his body, infection no doubt got into his body it started with a boil. God sent Isaiah the prophet to tell Hezekiah, you're going to die you're not going to live so how do we handle that? How do we deal with this issue of fear? By studying the life of Hezekiah, we can learn four things that he did to overcome his fear, and actually, the Bible says God added 15 years to his life when he heard his prayer and saw his tears. We either live by faith or fear, and the choice is ours to make. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and sound mind. For the rest of the story here is Pastor Dell. And today we're talking about a man in the Bible uh, who was given a death sentence actually. He was told by the prophet Isaiah who was sent by God uh, to relay to Hezekiah that he was going to die and so he needed to set his house in order. I wonder how you would have reacted, how I would have reacted, if I was told that I was going to die. I suppose that most of us uh, would be full of fear, anxiety, uh, but today we're going to turn the pages of the Bible uh, into the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 5, and we're talking about a man whose name was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. And so let's find out what he did when he was told that he was going to die. Now folks, I believe that the best self-help books, at least one of the best self-help books available today is the Bible. And I believe it's one of the best, if not the best, self-help uh, help books simply because uh, we are told by the Lord that the Holy Spirit, when He would come, He would lead us into all truth. I don't know about you folks, but aren't we hungry to hear truth today? We hear so, so many lies and falsehoods that uh, we're starving for uh, truth uh, to be told. And so today, this is a true story about Hezekiah and uh, what he did when he was told that he was going to die. Now we have this story for us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38, verses 1 through 5. And we thank you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to watch today's message, I believe that this message will be very encouraging uh, for you uh, as you uh, take notes and study uh, the Scripture along with me. Let's see what the Bible says. 700 years before Christ, 700 years before Christ, think about it, the Bible was written and it tells the story once again of Hezekiah. Look what it says. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Verse 2. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. I don't know if I fully understand uh, this verse in Psalm chapter uh, 56 and verse 8, where it says that God bottles our tears. Tears attract the attention of God. There's something about tears, folks, when we are brokenhearted and when we are hurting that attracts the attention of God. Hezekiah wept sore, the Bible says. In other words, he wept bitterly. 
Verse 4, Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, The God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. Not only did God say to Hezekiah, I have heard your prayers, but he also said, I have seen your tears, and I'm going to add, Hezekiah, 15 years to your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we love you today. I cannot. You never said I could. You can. You always said you would. Speak to us and through us. I pray in the name of Jesus with a humble heart and with a grateful heart. Amen. I'm talking to you today about how do we deal with fear. How do we deal with fear? In December of 2019, the first reported case of the coronavirus was reported. Since that day, almost 5 million people worldwide have died. In America, 45 million Americans have contracted uh, COVID. Over 700,000 Americans died. Perhaps you have known some of them. It literally shut down our country 16 months ago. And now we are told by the CDC that we are now in a major decline. 57% of the American population have been fully vaccinated. Many people who have had COVID and now they have antibodies in uh, their system. And the knowledge of this vicious disease is far greater than it was when it was first exposed way back in 2019. Now here's what I know, folks. I believe with all of my heart that we, that we are going to eventually, eventually, totally get past COVID. I believe that. And I believe that we are already on that path. But here's what I know. If we are not careful, COVID may be gone, but fear will still linger and control our lives. If we're not careful, the diseases, they may come and go. But if we are not careful, we will constantly be gripped by fear. And so we need to understand something, folks. There will always be disease. Always has been, always will be. And what I mean by that, did you ever stop to think about how Adam and Eve uh, sinned before God? When God created Adam and Eve, He created them with a perfect body. Absolutely perfect. But they sinned. And according to Romans 8 and 22, that sin brought corruption and disease into the entire world. And that is why to this day, the Bible says in Romans 8 and 22, the world uh, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So, here it is. How do we handle fear? How do we handle fear? How do we deal with fear? Charles Stanley said, there's basically two paths that we can walk. Charles Stanley said, uh, we can walk the path of fear, or we can walk the path of faith. The path of fear, or the path of faith. Because there will be disease. There are diseases today. As a matter of fact, research tells us, that six out of ten Americans battle some chronic uh, disease. It uh, could be a heart disease. It could be a cancer disease. It could be Alzheimer's disease. It could be a stroke, diabetes, uh, a kidney failure. But six out of ten Americans, research tells us, 
is babbling a disease. And uh, it is so bad in some people that fear will have a tendency to move into their lives and control their lives. And it will be the fear that grips people's hearts. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Fear defeats more people than any one thing in the world. Now there was a man in the Bible, as I have said, his name is Hezekiah. He was a good king. He became king when he was 25 years old, but when he was 39, he was diagnosed with a fatal disease. It got into his body, got into his bloodstream, infection set in, no doubt, and it all started, according to uh, the scripture in Isaiah 38 and verse 21, it all started with a boil. And literally, he was going to die. And so, how do we handle fear? I'm sure that Hezekiah, when he heard the news, uh, must have been gripped with fear. And so, I believe, that as we study the life of Hezekiah at this stage in his life, we can learn what he did to overcome his fear, and you and I can take the same steps that he took to conquer fear when it erupts into our lives. Four things. How did Hezekiah handle uh, his disease? The first thing I want you to see is he prayed. He prayed. Prayer, folks, is not complicated. Prayer is just carrying on a conversation with God. You don't have to have a theological degree uh, to pray. Prayer is just simply talking to God. And let me tell you something, folks. Without prayer, we don't have a prayer. And so the good thing that is available to us is the fact that God is no respecter of persons. God will hear your prayer when you pray. God will hear my prayer when I pray. And the first thing I want you to see, what I, uh, Hezekiah did, was the Bible says in verses 2 and 3, he just prayed. He prayed. I mean, he was disappointed. In verses 10 through 13, you can see the anguish uh, in his prayer. Uh, he talked about being in the prime of life. And he was talking with God, and he was in essence saying, God, are you going to take me out? I'm only 39. And here's what I want to say to you. I don't know what you may be going through as I speak. But I want you to be remembered that God is greater than any disease. I want to remind you that the Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 15, I believe the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I believe Psalm 107.20 that says that he sent forth his word and healed them. I believe Isaiah 53 and 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I've been asked over the years, Dale, do you have any problems with the virgin birth? My answer is always, absolutely not. Not a bit. I don't have one problem with the virgin birth, simply because God created uh, Adam and Eve, and just like the virgin birth where there was no a biological father involved. The same thing happened when God created Adam and Eve. Uh, he created Adam and Eve uh, with no daddy and no mama. So I have no problems uh, with the virgin birth. And so I've been asked, do you believe uh, in healing? And I say, absolutely, I do. Because we were eyewitnesses, some of us was, when a little granddaughter was, was uh, deathly sick with cancer and God miraculously healed her and today she is a 
five-year-old in kindergarten cancer-free. Yes, I believe in the miraculous healing of God. And now, um, if God can create a body, then He can heal a body. If something is broken in our body, God can heal that brokenness in our body. So, how do you think we got here? <laughs> how do you think we got here, folks? I see the first thing that Hezekiah did was to pray. Number two, the second thing Hezekiah did, I want you to see not only the prayer, but I want you to see the plan. If you look at verse 5, look what the Bible says. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father. Now hold it right there for just a moment, folks. Hezekiah was of the lineage of David. And God promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, that always the king of Judah would be from the lineage of David. So keep that in mind. But look what he said, uh, verse uh, uh, 5, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will add unto you 15 years. Understand something here, folks. Hezekiah was a king. He was a good king, but it was going to be three years before his son Manasseh would be born. And so, if you're following me, the plan of God wouldn't be fulfilled until Manasseh uh, was born. And by the way, the plan of God is going to be fulfilled. God has a plan for your life, and God has a plan for my life, and that plan by God will be Fulfilled. <clears throat> Folks, if God said an elephant was going to lay an egg, well, go get your skillet because it's going to happen. The plan of God is going to be fulfilled. But folks, here's what we have to do. We have got to learn to trust God. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And so... Rather than trying to work everything out ourselves, we have got to lean on God and trust God. Even though we may not understand the plan, we still have to learn to trust God. I was intrigued by a sports story. Uh, one time, uh, Michigan State, way back in 1982, Michigan State was playing a football game uh, against Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, Michigan State was just trouncing uh, Wisconsin. And the broadcasters that were broadcasting the game noticed that the people in the stands, they were clapping and they were cheering when their home team was being soundly defeated by Michigan State. And so one of the broadcasters said to the other one, why don't you go down into the stands and just see what's going on? Well, and so he did. He went down into the stands and he discovered that a lot of the people uh, in the stands from Wisconsin, even though their team was being trounced by Michigan State, they had their transistor radios on. Remember those days? And they were listening uh, to the World Series up in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee had just won the World Series. And so they were clapping and uh, cheering uh, the Milwaukee team on. And so uh, uh, that broadcaster was down in the playing field. And the fans... We're not paying attention to the football game there. Uh, they were someplace else. And folks, here's the lesson. Uh, we're here right now. God is up there and something is going on. God is at work in our lives. 
And God's got a plan for our lives. Even though we may not understand the plan, God's got a purpose for our lives, even though we may not understand that purpose. But uh, we're down here. God is up there. And so we just have to learn to trust God. Hold on here now. We have seen Hezekiah's prayer. We have seen uh, the plan. But there's a third thing. This story really gets interesting, folks. I see the prescription here. I see the prescription. Now talk about home remedies. I'm sure all of us have our own home uh, remedies. If I had been the doctor and Hezekiah had this massive boil and it was infected, I would have said, well, we need to lance that boil. We need to drain that thing. We need to get the infection out of the system. And we're going to throw some antibiotic cream onto it and some uh, amoxicillin uh, we're going to put into the system. And that's how we're going to treat it. God had another plan. God said, no, my plan is I want uh, you to take a fig. Talk about home remedies. Take a fig. 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 7 tells us, you take that fig, you put that fig on top of that boil, and you shall recover. Now here's what's interesting. God could have healed Hezekiah miraculously. I believe that with all of my heart. Uh, he didn't have to use a fig, but he did. Now, folks, there's a lesson here for us. When we get a disease, when our health deteriorates, and we get sick, what do we do? I'll tell you what we do. The Bible recommends that when you get a disease, when I get a disease, when we get sick, uh, you talk to God about it. You talk to God about it, and then you get the best medical treatment that you can. Understand something. God is Jehovah Rapha. Now, whether you take a pill or not take a pill, Either way, God is still the healer. He's the one to be praised. So, how did Hezekiah handle this fatal disease? He was sick. Didn't have long to live. What did he do? Well, he prayed. He uh, saw the plan. He had a plan. Number three, we have seen the prescription but look at number four. Number four, I want you to see the praise in Hezekiah's life. Look at verse 20. Look what he said. He said, I've been sick. I've been deathly sick. I've had this boil. But he said, God touched me and healed me. And I'm not going to praise the fig. I'm going to praise God. I'm not going to talk about uh, the prescription. I'm going to talk about what God did. What did God do about it? Because ultimately, folks, God is worthy of our praise. Look what he said in verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, look what he said. We will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of God the Lord. Let that sink in, folks. You know what he said? He said, I've been sick. I've been deathly sick. I haven't been able to go to church. But since God touched me, uh, I can't wait to get back to New Hope. <laughs> I can't wait to get back in church. I can't wait to get down there to the house of the Lord and sing praises and worship and public uh, corporate worship. Let me tell you something, folks. There is a place for streaming video church services. I recognize that. But if we are not careful, we will miss so much church that we will no longer miss church. That's true. 
And it'll be just common for you to uh, stay home with a bowl of Cheerios and a cup of coffee and uh, worship uh, on television instead of going into the house uh, of the Lord. And so, when we get sick, and when we don't feel good, and when our body is infected with a disease, how do we stay encouraged? These are the moments when we really need some encouragement. And the Bible has some good news that we can use on how to stay encouraged uh, when we don't feel, uh, don't feel well. Fear will be a visitor in your life and in my life, but it must not become a resident. We want to make sure that fear is a visitor in your life and that fear is a visitor in my life. You say, Dale, do you have bouts of fear? Absolutely, I do. We all do if the truth were known, but we must be on guard not to allow fear to become a resident, but only a visitor. We get into serious trouble when we allow fear to invade our system of thinking and it becomes a resident. We must not let that happen. We must be sure that fear may be a visitor, but never a resident. And so, um, how do I deal with fear? Four simple steps. Encouragement when dealing with fear. Four simple steps. Number one, we've got to get our thinking right. Dale Garnegie said this, he said, you can conquer almost any fear if you will only make up your mind to do so. For remember, fear doesn't exist anywhere except in the mind. That's what Dale Carnegie said about fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 tells us where fear comes from. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So... If fear does not come from God, where do you think it comes from, folks? It comes from our enemy. And so God has endued us with power. He has enriched us with his love. And he has enlightened our mind with a sound mind. God is not the author of fear. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It tells us that thoughts are going to come. Martin Luther said, You cannot prevent a bird from flying through your hair, but you sure can prevent that bird from building a nest in your hair. And so we must bring into captivity every thought that invades our mind. I don't know how it works for you. Sometimes I'll be having my, uh, my prayer and uh, as I am praying, talking to God, something, some thought comes into my mind. Uh, and we tend to be a little distracted. Has that ever happened to you? I'm sure that it has. And uh, I'd be praying, and all of a sudden, the thought comes, I got to get out there and, and uh, clean out that hangar. Uh, but we've got to make sure that we don't entertain thoughts. We've got to have a checkup, folks, from the neck up and get rid of that stinking negative thinking. So what do we do? Well, here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says. The latter part of that verse says, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought that invades our mind, we need to take that thought and make it captive. Uh, we've got to get our thinking straight, and we've got to realize just where did that thought come from. And look at the Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. One of my favorite books in the New Testament is the book of Philippians. And look what it says in chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. And so we need to get our thinking straight. And we need to get rid of stinking negative uh, thinking and get our thinking right. Here's the second step. Second step is that we want to find encouragement uh, when we are battling a sickness. We need to talk to ourselves. We need to talk to ourselves. We need to stop listening to ourselves. And we need to start talking to ourselves. Look what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You need to highlight that verse in your Bible, folks. God says, when you are sick, He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Now, folks, the truth of the matter is, I've had a lot of people walk out of my lives over these long years of pastoring. But thank God, He has never walked out of my life. Here's the promise right here, folks. He says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Look at the rest of that verse, verse 6. So that we may boldly say, we are talking to ourselves, so that we may boldly say, the Lord, He's my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So that we may boldly do what? Talk to ourselves so that we may boldly talk to ourselves and say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We need to talk to ourselves, folks. Should we be hospitalized or find ourselves in assisted living, we need to talk to ourselves. I'm not here alone. God is here with me. He said in His Word, that he would never leave me nor forsake me. So God is right here uh, with me. Now, folks, I was reading recently Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 26. Look what it says. There is none like unto the God of Jezreel, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. God is the God of the mountain. That's a beautiful song. I love to hear it sung. God, you're right there on the mountaintop. You're there in high places. Whenever things are going good, God, you are there on the mountain. It was on Mount Moriah where God appeared unto Adam and uh, Abraham and Isaac. It was God on Mount Horeb, where he appeared to Moses in the burning bush. On Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. It was on Mount Carmel that God appeared to Elijah and fire came down. Fire was called by, by Elijah from the mountaintop on Mount Carmel and fire came, came down. And so this verse teaches us God you're the God in good times. You're the God when we are on the mountaintop. God, you're the God in high places. God is with us, folks, on the mountaintop. But look at the very next verse. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. I want you to highlight that word underneath. I did some research on that word underneath, and in Hebrews, in the Hebrew language in which the Old Testament uh, was written, it means bottom out. It means flat 
bottom. Now here's the good news that we can use, folks. God is with us on the mountaintop. But when we are on the bottom, down in the valley, uh, when we are as low as low can be, God is with us. And so we need to talk to ourselves on the mountaintop. And when we have bottomed out, God is there with us. We need to talk to ourselves, folks. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10 said, uh, Tell yourself, let the weak say I'm strong. So I'm strong today. God said, talk to yourself. I'm strong today. And with God's help, we can face any situation that may develop in our lives and in our schedule for that day. What makes us strong? Talking to ourselves. Let the weak say, I am strong. Kind of like the guy that said, I took my knife out and I cut the tail off of a vicious lion. Somebody said, well, why didn't you cut his head off? <laughs> he said, somebody had already done that. Wow. God has already, folks, already God has defeated the enemy. Romans 8.31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.37 says, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And the Bible says in 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Encouragement. How do we get it? When fear invades our system of thinking. We've got to get our thinking right. We've got to talk to ourselves. Number three, realize and believe that God has given us faith and not fear. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. The latter part of that verse says, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God's dealt with every person. The measure of faith. You see, folks, God is uh, omniscient. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He knows everything that we're going through. And so he has given us a measure of faith to get through that situation. In other words, God has deposited the faith that we need to handle any situation, folks. God knew that everything that we experience and what we go through, some really tough times, folks. And so God knew that we would be going through these very, very difficult times. So what did he do? He deposited a measure of faith to help us Walk through it. Isn't that encouraging? I think that it is. God knew every struggle. God knew every hardship that we were going through. And God said, I know all about it. And I just deposited a measure of faith, just enough faith for you to get through it. I just deposited enough faith in you to get through no matter whatever you're going through. You say, you know, Dale, I'm at my wit's end. I just can't handle anymore. Oh, yes, you can. Because God said, I've just deposited a measure of faith in you. And so all we need to do, folks, is just tap into it. And we will get through it. Understand something, folks. When fear knocks at your door, here's what you do. You send faith to the door. Door opens, guess what? No one is there. When faith uh, opens the door, fear is nowhere to be seen. Now let me give you the last point on how we can keep encouraged uh, when we don't feel good. Number four, we live our lives with an eternal perspective. We live our lives with an eternal 
perspective. Look at what Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. You know, folks, isn't it so sad? I think it is. So sad that most of our thinking and the way we live is short-term thinking and, and we live in the short-term perspective in life instead of the long-term. Many people in our culture today is consumed with short-term living and thinking. And so we must live with an eternal perspective. Now in my man cave, on one wall, I have LP albums that blanket that wall. And so when people visit me in my man cave, I simply point to uh, those LP covers. Uh, there's a Hank Snow there, there's a Roy Acuff there, there's a, a Jack Green there. Uh, there's a Conway Twitty uh, there, and I say these people uh, used to walk across the stage and perform. And now, as you look at these LP covers, uh, we are left with only a memory. Folks, truth of the matter is, this life on this earth is very, very, very short. We are only guaranteed by the Bible, three score and ten. And if the Lord wills, more. But if we live to be 95, still life is very, very short. You look back over your life that you have lived, and if the truth were known, it's only a blur, folks, unless we have made some highlights uh, with our lives and so we must learn to live with an eternal perspective. Now a year and a half ago uh, COVID hit our world and it hit it hard and March of 2019 churches were ordered closed down and so we did not have church for 16 months and so we uh, relied upon streaming online church services and so for 16 months I couldn't go to church and here's the point I'm trying to make we we watched the Seahawks lose a football game and we get so down and discouraged over a football game that a year from now we won't even remember. But my point is, do we get so upset and discouraged because we can't go to church in those 16 months? I don't know how you felt about that, but I was really down for those 16 months because I couldn't go to church. I love going to church. I've been in church, folks, all of my life. In my mother's womb, she carried me uh, into the church. And when we could not have church, boy, did I miss it. I really, really did. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, fear that I thank God. I do not. I Cholera may come again next summer. I pray it may not, but if it does, it matters not to me. I'll toil and visit the sick by night and day until I drop. And if it takes me sudden death, it's sudden glory. That's what the Prince of Preachers said uh, in his ministry. Folks, I got news for you. I refuse to be controlled by fear. A visitor? Yes, indeed. But it does not become a resident in my life. I refuse to be controlled 
by fear. Folks, I know people that are living in constant fear. I choose not to live that kind of a life. I live by faith, by the Word of God. And when I face tough times, God deposits a measure of faith uh, in my belief system to get me through the most difficult trying times that I may face. Years ago, while pastoring in Reno, Nevada, Marianne and I visited San Francisco and uh, we drove across the Golden State Bridge. I don't know if you know this or not, but when they were constructing uh, that bridge, it took forever because some of the workers fell off the scaffolding and died. And so a lot of the construction workers were fearful of working on the bridge. And the pace of the construction was at a snail's pace. It just slowed way, way down and nothing seemingly was getting done because they were literally scared to death of falling uh, off the scaffolding. Then somebody said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's put a net underneath the bridge. And so they put a net underneath the bridge and basically nobody fell, maybe one or two, but when they fell, they fell into the net. The net caught them and saved them. All I'm trying to say, folks, is that we have a net. Either way, we win because we have a net. The psalmist said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and my staff shall comfort me. Folks, realize we have a net. And so, as I conclude my message today, question is asked, is there anybody that ought to be controlled by fear? And I say, well, as a matter of fact, there is. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but fear them rather which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Bodies may go, but thank God they can't kill the soul. We ought to be fearful if we know that our heart is not right with God. And folks, I want to tell you something. This life is short. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Eternity is long. It never ends. And so, folks, eternity is too long to be wrong. And so, you may say, well, I hope so. I have a home in heaven, folks. That is not worth a plug nickel. It really isn't. I think so. That doesn't cut it. We must have the assurance of knowing beyond a shadow of doubt that when God pulls down the curtain on your life and on my life, we know that we have a home in heaven. That fear of not knowing for sure that our heart is right with God should be motivation to move us toward God. And God actually put that fear there so that He could bring that fear unto uh, Himself. And so you may be thinking, watching this message, and uh, you might be thinking, well, you know, Dale, that the truth will know, I don't know for sure that I... I do have a home in heaven when I die. I don't know for sure that my heart is right. Folks, I would like to share with you a prayer, a simple prayer that you can pray so that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your heart is right with God. That is so important, folks, because... Uh, life is so fragile and so, so uncertain.
we have no guarantee that we'll see the sunrise tomorrow. So it's really important that we know that our heart is right with God. And I would like to lead you in a prayer. The words are printed on the screen. Will you pray it with me? I trust that you will. Just say these words. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and all my sin. I confess them to you right now, God. Come into my life, Lord, and forgive me. Now thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Folks, if you prayed that prayer and you were sincere, then your heart is in a right relationship with God. So, when sickness comes, when tough times comes, I encourage you to remember these steps that Hezekiah took. And that God heard his prayer, God saw his tears, and added 15 years unto his life. I think right here embedded in Isaiah chapter 38, folks, is good news that you can use. Oh, say.